Open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go a little bit deeper into some of these uh, gifts that we have been studying this afternoon. One of the interesting things um, about Christ and comparing him to us, if you will, something that we should recognize is that Christ revealed himself first in human bodily form. That's called the incarnation. That's the first time people laid their eyes on Christ. He's God. He's the Trinity. He's the second part of the Trinity. Second time, though, that he, uh, or the second incarnation, if you will, would be the church, the believers. You know how people today lay their eyes on Christ? It's in you. It's through you. It's through everybody that professes themselves to know the Lord as their personal Savior. That's why it's very imperative then that uh, we act like a believer when we're out in this world. If others know that you're a Christian, we need to show the love of Christ. We need to show that Christ is in us. It draws others to him. And it's very imperative then in the church that we show Christ to each other. And as we talk about, we've been talking about the body of Christ, the illustration that we have before us, it's important that we all do our parts because if we don't, this body hurts and suffers in a major way. On top of it, we're all an individual member, aren't we? While we're part of the whole, we each have our own little thing that we do. We each have our own little thing that's highly important. There's no one that's more important in the church than someone else. There's not this greater emphasis because the fact of the matter is we can't live with certain without certain parts of the body, can we? Or when certain parts of the body don't work correctly, the whole body knows it. We need it. You are important. So we must work together. And, and when we do that, it brings together the fully functioning body. I will tell you, generally, across the face of the earth, the body of Christ is not functioning very well. <laughs> As a matter of fact, even between churches in towns, they're in competition with each other, aren't they? They, they fight for each other's members. They, they fight for those that uh, might have more money than others. They talk bad about the church down the road. They tell others that come to their church that, you know, the church down the road is no good. And that's just not helping things out, is it? I can tell you uh, the church that I used to pastor um, had a family visit my church. They told me that they visited the church across town the week before. They told the church across town that they were coming, that they were going to go visit my church. And so they gave them all the warnings about my church. Oh, they believe you can lose your salvation. They believe this, they believe that. They were, it's not even true, of course. And so um, they came and visited. and. Um, we were having a conversation. Little did I know that the guy I was talking to in high school, we played basketball against each other. He, I played for Howardsville. He played for um, South Bend Grace Christian. And so we, we played against each other in high school basketball. But he had come up and he started talking to me. He says, I got a question for you. I said, oh, go ahead. He said, do you believe you can lose your salvation? I said, absolutely not. He said, he looked at his wife and said, I told you they wouldn't believe it. And I said, why, why would you think that? And he said, because they, they told us down the road that you do. And I said, well, glad you came and asked. Because we don't, and I'm not going to say anything bad about them. It's not the right thing to do, is it? That's not what we should be doing. We're not here to fight against each other. We're all part of the same family of God. We need to be encouraging each other and helping each other with the same common tasks. So as we function, we work we minister, we build each other up. Christ manifests himself in us, and it's all to the glory of God. That's what we're here for, by the way. We're here to glorify God. It's a wonderful thing, too, because while my ministry might be behind the pulpit, I preach, I minister to you. Hopefully, as uh, God reveals things through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Scripture, and, and I help you to see what Scripture says, and I help to encourage you and help you to grow. You take that, you grow through the ministry that God has given to me, and then you have special gifts and abilities that God has given to you. You minister back to me. 
You know what? You might show me grace and mercy, and I can learn about grace and mercy from you. I struggle with mercy. I struggle with thinking that someone else's problems are bigger than mine. I struggle with the idea that I need to reach out to someone because they got some kind of problem that seems like no big deal to me. And I picked myself up by my bootstraps and I, you know, did this and I did that. It's hard for me to look at someone and feel sorry for them and have pity upon them. I think they need to be an adult and grow. Well, then I see you minister to me in your grace and mercy. And it helps me to understand a little bit more about that. And I grow in my own faith as you minister to me. It's a wonderful thing. You build me up. I build you up. We build each other up. We build others around us up. Because guess what? There's gifts and abilities that you guys have that I don't have. And I need to be ministered in those ways. So I want to give you the basic principles in which these spiritual gifts operate. And this is going to wrap up the whole that we've been talking about, but we've been talking about it for so long, I'm afraid that some of our beginning points have kind of lost their meaning to us by this point in time or lost ourselves in the outline. Believe it or not, I work off an outline. And um, I want to just catch you up with that outline and then throw ourselves into some new content. So first of all, in verse number one, we said that spiritual gifts are essential. They are essential. Essential. That's the word I keep wanting to say. They're essential. They're needed. Don't be ignorant about them. And that's exactly what verse number one says, right? Don't be ignorant. They're there. Don't ignore their, that they're there. Know what they are. Number two, verses two through three, we find out that anything that God does, Satan will counterfeit. There's false prophets. God has given prophets. There's false prophets. There's false preachers. God has given preachers. There's false preachers. Any kind of gift and ability that is there, Satan will counterfeit. He uses his demons that used to be angels. He works in and through people. And so you have to be very careful that you are not being involved with a counterfeit gift. Something that Satan is doing. It happens. How does he do it? First of all, fleshly, I get myself uh, into the gift and I don't let the Holy Spirit do it. I desire something so bad, I just want to do it. I can't stand it. There's some churches that teach that you must do certain gifts or you're not a Christian. So they, in their flesh, go off and do those gifts. That's my flesh getting involved with it. Secondly, then say, there's satanic counterfeits, that's the false prophets, that's the teachers, they're all mouthpieces for Satan. So number one, your gifts are essential. Number two, they're counterfeited. Number three, in verses 7 and 11, we saw that the Holy Spirit's the source of these gifts. You don't ask for a gift. The gift is given to you. You don't try to go out and seek the gift. It's dispersed by God, the Holy Spirit. He gives each and every one of us differently. And your gift is not less important than someone else's gift. It's needed. Number four, the gifts unite the body. They never divide the body. That's what's wonderful about all these different gifts. We all get to do our little part, and it brings us all together. As you minister, as I minister as we look at each other and do it for them. Number five, there is no relation to spirituality and your gifts. Well, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1, we find out that this is a, an extremely carnal church. They are doing everything wrong. There, there's not much spirituality about them at all. And yet, they were still exercising their gifts. Some of them grossly wrong, but they still had spiritual gifts, and they were still using them. So just because someone is using a spiritual gift does not necessarily mean that they are right with God and that they're spiritual, that they're holy. God can use you despite of yourself. God did it. Time and time again, I have no doubts that there are preachers who don't even know the Lord as their personal Savior, 
but happened to preach a sermon from the Word of God that clearly divides the Word of Truth, and someone comes to know the Lord as their personal Savior, even though the preacher is not a believer themselves. That is the power of the Word of God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. God can use you despite yourself. Number six, your, your spiritual gift is not for yourself. It's for everybody else. That, that's why you shouldn't go off saying, oh, I want this gift, I want that gift. Why do you want it? Because it makes you look good? That's not what it's for. It's for you to minister to someone else. Your gift is for others. That's verse number five and verse number seven. Point number seven. Your spiritual gifts have the promise of divine energy. Your spiritual gifts have the promise of divine energy. You are a divine channel. If God has given you the gift, then through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to energize you to, give, to, to utilize that gift. He promises that. Number eight, there are a variety of gifts. No two Christians are alike. Remember me saying that there's, you probably have four or five different gifts all thrown together and mixed together, and it may even go deeper than that. You mix all of that up, and that's you individually. And that can be for everybody. Your mixture of gifts might be extremely similar to someone else's gifts, but there's probably little variances in there that make you unique, that make you different. And I would dare say there are no two human beings that are exactly the same when it comes to spiritual gifts. That's how diverse they are. There might be some general themes that are the same, but never worked out the same. Number nine, you can have the gift and not use it. That's a shame. That's a hardship for the church. Paul told Timothy to stir up his gift when we studied 2 Timothy. We need to use it. Number 10, there are many terms to describe these divine enablements. In verses 1 through 7, he calls it energizings, he calls it services, he calls it manifestations, he calls them grace gifts, he calls them spirituals. There's a lot of different words that were used as we went through here to describe spiritual gifts. Number 11, we're only going to number 14. Number 11, this list is not exhaustive. What we have listed here are not all the spiritual gifts that there are. Matter of fact, you can go to some other lists and they have different ones. I was reading what different people, that some people declare that there's this many spiritual gifts and they'll write them all out for you. And then someone else will come along and write a different list. I saw someone, they, they had 25 spiritual gifts that you can have and they had all 25 of them listed. I don't know what the real list looks like. Since God uniquely gifts all of us and sprinkles them all together in much different ways. There's probably way more than we even know. It goes beyond our imagination, I think. Number 12, all gifts are to build the body. What is your gift for? To build this body, to make it stronger, to see others come to know the Lord as their personal Savior, to encourage each other. 13, some gifts are also sign gifts. Talk a little bit about sign gifts. We'll talk a little bit more about them next week. Sign gifts just simply meaning that um, there's a sign. And, it, and the way I usually think about it is when you're driving down the highway, before we all had GPSs, there's little signs along the way that tell you how to get somewhere, right? They point you to somewhere. A sign gift simply points you to something. Talk about that in more detail next time. 14. They are distinctly different from the fruits of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit does something. It gives you the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, difference. Then there's the spiritual gifts. They're different things. Some people get them all goofed up. Point of all of that is to lead us all the way down here to verse number 28, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That basically covers everything we've studied through 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. And we're introduced to some interesting people in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
And I think this is going to be interesting for us to kind of study this out because I think there's a great misconception about this verse alone. It says, And God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. We're going to talk about them too today. Let me start off with saying, Are there apostles and prophets today? The answer is no. We do not have prophets. We do not have apostles. If someone is calling themselves prophets and apostles, more than likely they're using the term in the wrong way. Or they're false. <laughs> By the way, Ephesians chapter 4 says he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets. This isn't the only place where it's listed. So if you'll go to Ephesians in chapter 4, real quick, I want you to see something interesting. So that's going to lead us to what this really means here. Ephesians chapter 4. Huh. That made me nervous. I was in Philippians chapter 4 and I was thinking... That's nowhere close to the words I was hoping to see here. Yeah, so in Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse number 11, that's where he says that he gave some apostles and some prophets. But if we go back, we should read the whole, right? We shouldn't just see what a little section says. If we go back into verse number 7 of Ephesians in chapter 4, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What does God do for us? What does the Holy Spirit do for us? He gives us grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Then in verse number 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Different word for gifts here than spiritual gifts. This is something special. In verse number 7, he says he gives gifts, which are spiritual gifts. In verse number 8, and in verse number 11, it literally says that he gives gifted men. It's a different category completely. It's a different word completely. We all have spiritual gifts that we're to use for God. That comes when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But there are gifted men that God has given to the church. Totally different. Completely different. And then if you go down to verse number 12, look at what they are to do. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. What did he give those gifted men to do? He gave them to the church for the building of the saints. When someone comes and says, Pastor Matt, what do you do? And I would venture to say, although it's hard for me to think back all the way back 15 years ago when Doug and Alvin and I own and Lori and little Jordan and Libby were running around, met me down here at the church. And, well, they couldn't have been, but like five, eight years old, right? Yeah. 15 years ago. <laughs> Almost 16 years ago now that I would have gone down there. And when I talked to them, and I know when I, when I basically was interviewed for my other pastorate, I told them, the work of the minister is found right there in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 12. It is for the perfecting of the saints. That's my job, if you will, in a nutshell. That's what I am supposed to do. And these verses literally say, God has gifted certain men to do that. We don't all have that gift. It's not a spiritual gift per se. God has gifted certain men for that, and then he also gives me spiritual gifts. Which is, I'm going to tell you, a pastor or teacher. 
That's the spiritual gift that I have. My spiritual gift is not, what is it called? Prophet and apostle. But God gave the prophet and the apostle to start the early church. He gave the pastor teacher to continue the church. And we'll speak a little bit more about that as we move through here. So, what do we have in 1 Corinthians? Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and let's start winding this all back together now. So in the middle of talking about spiritual gifts, it says in verse 28, and God hath set some in the church. Doesn't say anything about a spiritual gift here, does it? He has set he has given some men this position. What is it? Apostle, secondarily, prophets. What, when we talk about apostle, what is an apostle? Well, it's primarily a gifted man in the history of the church that, that we've seen. The word is apostolos. It's just a word for messenger. I think we kind of already uh, told you about that before. There's nothing fancy about the word apostle. It simply means a slave that has a message to deliver for his master. The apostles had a message to deliver, and it came from God. Christ taught them. They went out. By the way, the first apostle was Jesus Christ. We learned that in Hebrews 3, verse number 1. Then there were 12 apostles. Some would say, well, Pastor Matt, there's 13 or there's 14. I want to correct you on that. Well, not really true. Was Judas really an apostle? <laughs> he was called one, but really, he wasn't even a Christian, right? Judas is in hell. You have Matthias that took his spot. He's still part of the 12. Then some people would say, well, that was a mistake. That was men going out and doing their own thing, and they just drew straws and whatever. Matthias is an apostle, okay? I'll also tell you there isn't a 13th apostle, and his name is Paul. But he's a special apostle with a special commission. An, ap an apostle, by the way, and, and, and so Romans chapter 1 and verse number 1, Paul calls himself an apostle. So he is an apostle. That's from the direction of the Holy Spirit. An apostle had to be those who had seen and heard and had a vital personal relationship with Jesus Christ in a physical presence. They had to see Christ. That is one of the things that made you an apostle. So if someone comes along today and says, I'm an apostle, you got to ask them where they saw Christ. Well, he showed himself to me in a dream, or he did this, or he did that. It, it's just not true. It's fake. It's false. If they call themselves an apostle today, they're either confused about what the term is, or they're a false apostle and we shouldn't be following they also had to by the way see the resurrected christ that's in acts chapter 1 and verse 22 that was in reference to matthias did paul see the resurrected christ yes he did <laughs> no doubt about it knocked him off his horse didn't he on his way to damascus by the way he saw the resurrected christ on three different occasions. When those men died, apostleship ended. And by the way, if it was needed today in the church, then how come in the epistles that is written to the churches, it's never listed as something that needs to be done and how we would go about getting it? How would we go about seeing the resurrected, resurrected Christ today? It would have to tell you in there how to do it. And in the founding churches, way back when, go back 1,800 years ago, they weren't talking about apostles. They knew it had ended. So the foundation of the church was made by apostles. They were made by prophets. I'll tell you, today, they've been taken over by evangelists, teaching pastors, and teachers. That's what we have today. 
And so when he says here that God has set some in the church, apostles, prophets, those have passed away. Now you have the teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues, those things, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists, that's what we have today. And by the way, when we talk about them, nowhere when it talks about a bishop, your pastor, the teacher, nowhere in there does it say that he has to see the resurrected Christ. It's not one of our, it's a good thing because I've never seen him. When I do, tell me to retire. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse number 12, that's 2 Corinthians. If you go over to 2 Corinthians 12, something interesting there happens too. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. You know what one of the things that an apostle had to do? They had to perform miracles. You know what's one of the reasons why I can't be an apostle? I have never performed a miracle. I tried, but it didn't work. It's not true. I've never even tried. I know I can't do it. I can't pull off a miracle. Peter, by the way, he could heal, couldn't he? You know, it says that as Peter walked through town and his shadow passed over people, they were healed. He healed with nothing more than his shadow. He was a miracle worker. He was an apostle. We don't need apostles. We already have doctrine. We have the foundation. That's what they're for. They gave us doctrine. They gave us the foundation for the church. Once that's established, once it's over with, we don't need that anymore. Second word there is prophets. Prophet means one who speaks out. Usually when we talk about a prophet, we think of someone that predicts the future, don't we? In a lot of cases, that's what the world would think about. In the medieval times, it's when it took on that meaning, by the way. It was always connected with speaking forth or speaking for God. When people in the Bible days thought about it, it was someone that was speaking forth for God. They gave God a voice to this world. What's the difference between a prophet and an apostle? In many cases, not much, right? <laughs> Sometimes, or Paul, Paul was called both, wasn't he? He was a prophet and he was a, an apostle. He had a message to deliver and he went out and delivered it. That made him both. The real difference is that the apostle had a broad-based ministry to the church worldwide. The prophet had a ministry to the local congregation. So you can, can you see a little bit into what we have today? An apostle was to a broad category. That's an evangelist, right? He goes out. That's a missionary. He goes out. There are modern-day apostles, if you were. They just don't have that category to be placed in. They don't perform miracles. The other thing, then, when we talk about a prophet, that was to the local congregation. That's your pastors in today's day and age. Apostles, prophets have really been placed, replaced with evangelists, pastors, teachers. So, are you an apostle? Are you a prophet? I'm going to tell you that while you've never seen Christ, the risen Christ, and while you've never been taught by Christ directly, and while you don't perform miracles and things like that, you have a message to deliver for the master. So in a way, we still have that same ministry that we need to be involved with. Some people are uniquely gifted or uniquely placed by God to do that. So guess what? God has placed pastors and uniquely gifted them to deliver that message. And God has uniquely placed evangelists to go out. I am not a great evangelist, by the way. 
My older brother, he's an evangelist. He uh missionary in Guyana, pastor there in uh, Chicago, and now he's gone on to he's basically an evangelist with the mission organization that he's with. He travels across the world, he preaches, he teaches. That's his ministry. God has gifted him that way. I I struggle when uh especially if I got to preach with an interpreter. I've preached with an interpreter a couple of times. He does it and does a good job. I've done a couple of times, and it's tough to preach with an interpreter. <laughs> and, and I think part of the problem is I, I start to preach, and, 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 and so I'll, I'll tell one little phrase, and I expect them to tell the phrase, but I haven't said enough of my phrase for them to accurately translate it into the language that I'm speak that I'm trying to translate it into. So they're looking at me to say more, and I'm looking at them to translate and they're like, where are you going with this? And I'm like, well, well, here's where I'm going. Okay, well, I can translate that now. So it gets very, very, very difficult if you've never preached with a translator to do it. You got to actually speak in uh, full, um, uh, more than just full sentences. You, you got to go to whole paragraphs for them to actually translate it correctly. And it gets very difficult. Some people are just uniquely gifted to do that. They know where you're going with it. They know what's happening. God is in control. He's making it happen. Next week, we are going to continue down our study, and it's going to say pastors there. And then it has some other things there that we really need to discuss about, don't we? And, and dive into pretty good because there are some real misconceptions about some of the things that are listed there. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this lesson you've given to us. Thank you that we can study your words. Thank you that we can see um, how you have done different things. And while uh, being a, an apostle, being a uh, prophet, that, that's not a spiritual gift necessarily that you've given, but that you've placed men in those positions and then uniquely gifted them to act in those ways. I pray, Lord, that as we think about that, we think about our pastors, we think about our evangelists, we think about our teachers, we think about the leaders in our church. I pray that we can accurately divide the word of truth, that we can uh, use our ministry for others around us, and Lord, that we can just uh, be unified here at Faith Bible Church, and that we can encourage each other and help each other grow. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have